Father, you have invited us into your presence. Oh, Father, you know what is good for us. You know what is healthy for us. You have called us to be with you, to listen to your voice. Oh, Jesus, speak to us today on this feast of Corpus Christi. Let your, word, let your voice penetrate our hearts. Let your voice touch our hearts. We so desperately seek your voice, O oh Jesus. For every situation we face, we want to hear your voice. For family situations, we want to hear your voice. For situations at work, we want to hear your voice. For our brokenness, we want to hear your voice. Speak to us, Lord. We, your children, desire to listen. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 onwards. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn into two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Mother, intercede and pray for us. Hail Mary, full of, full grace. of grace, the, the Lord, Lord is, is with thee. thee. Blessed, blessed art thou amongst, amongst women. women, and blessed, blessed is the fruit of thy, of thy womb, womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Can you be seated? Praise the, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Good morning, dear friends. And a warm welcome to this day's service and our, our retreat on this feast of Corpus Christi. I'm Father Michael. I'm a Vincentian priest. I reside here in this retreat center. Praise the Lord. Praise How many of you are coming here for the first time? Can you raise your hands? Those of you who are here for the first time, most welcome. Uh, to this retreat. May the Lord's blessings and grace rest upon you in a special way. And may the Lord's blessings and grace rest upon the rest of us also in a special way. Just because you have come here before, you're not here the first time, doesn't mean that you, uh, we do not desire that you receive the blessings and graces of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Today is the beautiful feast of Corpus Christi. It is a, um, a feast where we celebrate the body and blood of Jesus. 
And today's retreat, we pray uh, with and through the powerful blood of Jesus, the power of the blood of Jesus upon us, upon our families, upon every situation that we are facing. Praise the Lord. Blood becomes a very, um, we don't have to specify it, but blood becomes a very essential part of living. We all know that. And without blood, there is no, there's no life. Without blood, there is no life. And that is why out of all the donations you see happening, the most common of donations is blood donation. And it is the most significant as well. And that is why even in a surgery or an operation that they are going through, they will always have blood in stock just in case, because once blood runs out, it's over. With that, nothing else can be done. Praise the Lord. And it is a very blessed experience to even donate blood to someone else. You know that they are actually getting life because of the blood that you donate. Praise the Lord. How many of you have donated blood? Can you raise your hands? Typical Christians, we keep it all to ourselves. We're so afraid we'll run off, we'll run, run out of blood. <laughs> Praise God. When we were in the seminary, um, I remember we used, to, we used to be called often to, uh, to donate blood. That was something that uh, we were called very often. So from the hospital, they'll call us, or from the blood bank, they'll call us, and they'll ask for any specific blood and they'll say, can you send brothers to donate uh, for that particular uh, specific blood? Now, uh, honestly, it's one of the best places to contact. When you want blood or you are in emergency, one of the best places to contact is the seminary. One, because um, you will get a lot of variety of blood there. <laughs> So you can have all the A, the A positives, B, B positives, negatives, or whatever you want, X, Y, Z, you'll find everything over there. And more than anything else, you'll find a lot of brothers very excited about donating blood. Now, there's a reason why, because that's one of the times when we can actually leave the seminary. So we get an opportunity to go to... Uh, to the hospital and come back, get to see some others apart from just us. And uh, so, so we are very interested. And then when you, when you actually go there, you donate blood. And at the end of donating blood, they generally give you one juice. So the brothers were interested in the juice as well. And, and if it's Usually a family would, would want it, so they send a car to pick us up. Now, usually we've, in the seminary, we only see the priests uh, getting picked up in a car. You, when we go out, it's always you've got to take the bus and go. So uh, one of the only times we get picked up in the car is when we're going to donate blood. So the family will come and pick us up. So the car will come to the porch and all the others will watch. You get into the car, it feel, you feel like a king. And uh, then we go for blood donation. Also, when we are coming back, usually if it's around lunchtime, in India especially, if it's around lunchtime, they will take you out and give you a very, very yummy biryani. And Indian biryanis are very, very good. I'm very sorry to tell you, um, Sri Lankan biryani is very poor. <laughs> We've tried it. And now don't come and try and stuff me with biryanis and say, Father, this one is very good. I'm sorry, period. You are not good in, in making biryanis. <laughs> uh, my brother lives in Hyderabad. So the Hyderabadi biryani is one of the best. So that's the kind of taste that... Uh, generally we have. Any which way, so the brothers, the brothers enjoyed uh, going out. So that's why I said one of the best bets to get blood donation, contact the seminary. You will definitely not be disappointed. You'll always get it. Now, once we were asked to, uh, to go and donate blood for a child who was suffering from leukemia, and uh, the only problem this time was we were right in between our exams. And so none of us were interested in going. So when the priest called all of us, the rector called all of us, and he asked us, 
uh, can someone go? We require blood for uh, a child uh, who is suffering from leukemia. Uh, immediately when he started saying, all the brothers started looking down. You know, as long as there's no eye contact, it's fine, you escape. So all of them were looking down and the floor seemed more interesting than his face. Um, and then there were some foolish ones like me who kept looking at his face. And he looked at me and he said, yeah, okay, Michael, you'll go. He must have thought very healthy person. At the seminary, all of us very healthy. So you'll definitely get a lot out of us. And uh, so he said, you go. So two of us were asked to go. And the, and the sad thing was, uh, uh, the disappointing thing was there was no car coming to the porch. He said, you'll have to go by bus and you go to the hospital and give your, give your blood. So we went there to donate blood and it took a long, long time um, because uh, we actually had to go and uh, donate the platelets. So they would take the blood, they take off the platelets, they push the blood back in. So that's a big process and it took a long time. At the end, we, we got to meet the child. They asked us, do you want to meet the child? So we got to meet the child, small little one suffering from leukemia. And uh, uh, we met the child and the parents and we prayed for them. We came back. Um, we passed that exam in which ways God was merciful. Uh, after I became a priest, around a few years, I think it was four or five years after I became a priest. So now it had been around eight years altogether since that incident. I'd gone to Toronto for a retreat, to give a retreat, and there um, uh, some, uh, some of the volunteers, uh, organizers came and told me, Father, there's someone who wants to come and meet you. And um, so I asked them, you can send them, and, uh, and a mother came with her young son, and she told me, can you recognize us? I said, no. She said, you had come as a brother to donate blood for my son, and uh, she said, this is my son. Now there's nothing wrong with him. He's, uh, he's been totally cured of his leukemia and he's very, very healthy. Praise God. Now, just because you're sick, don't ask me to come and give you my blood. Now my blood is all old and haggard and it's all kind of gone, but not very good. Well, the joy you get, you know, even for me, now that's been so many, so many years since that particular incident, 14 years since that incident, but I can't, I can't forget that, that, that whole experience of seeing that child and the hug the child gave me, just the thought of how powerful blood actually is. And when you, when you kind of put it in the scheme of things to understand how powerful actually blood is, and then you think to yourself, compare that to the blood of Jesus. Compare it to the blood of Jesus and what the blood of Jesus means for us because of what the blood of Jesus has done for us and what the blood of Jesus can do for us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Mine was a one-off moment at you know, many, many years ago. Now, maybe you will think to yourself, oh, we heard this wonderful story. Let's call Father Michael and get some blood. And then I donate that blood. And then you're waiting, you know, like that child, maybe something will happen and nothing happens. And you'll be pretty disappointed because my blood is pretty much like a, a jackpot. Maybe you will hit it. Maybe you will not. But that's not how it is with Jesus. His blood is a sure bet, can never go wrong. And we read in Leviticus something very beautiful, very significant. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10 and 11. So these are the norms of uh, a consuming blood according to the Israelite tradition in the past. That is Leviticus Chapter 17, verse 10 onwards we read, If any one of the house of Israel or of the aliens who reside among them eats any blood, it will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut that person off from the people. And then in verse 11 it says, For the life of the flesh is in the 
is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the, in the blood. If the flesh does not have blood, the flesh does not have life. The life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it to you. Remember these words are from the book of Leviticus. That's in the Old Testament. Way, way, way back. I have given it to you for making atonement for your lives on the altar. For as life, it is the blood that makes atonement. Praise the Lord. It is the blood that makes atonement. And that is where Jesus in the New Testament would shed his blood, the blood that will give flesh life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the flesh has life because of the blood. Take blood out of the flesh. The flesh is, is dead. Hallelujah. 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 Are you alive? Yes. You sure? Praise the, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How do I know that some of you are alive, especially those whose heads are not to be seen? Or maybe too much of the head is to be seen, so there are two ways people sleep. One is with the head right down, with the neck nothing after that is seen. Or then there are those whose heads keep going up, the mouth will open. And that's why the reason, you know, when we die, sometimes they, they tie, the, uh, tie the gauze over there so that the mouth doesn't open. So how would I know that you are alive or you are dead? Because your flesh has, has blood. Praise the Lord. Flesh has life because of the, of the blood. And here now in the book of Leviticus, the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you. I have given it to you. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 23. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 23. So I just want you to understand how significant the blood is for us. Um, Deuteronomy 12, 23. Let's read. Only be... That you do not eat the blood. For the blood is the life. Blood is the life. So if I am to say that I have life, that blood becomes very significant. And that is why the, the, um, the verse in Leviticus, let's continue the verse in Leviticus. Let's go to verse 14. Leviticus 17 verse 14. For the life of every creature, its blood is its life. Therefore, I have said to the people of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any creature. For the life of every creature is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The blood of every creature is its life. Praise the, Lord. Praise the Lord. Now Jesus shed his blood to give us, to give us eternal life. So now when we, when we, when we read of what, what happened to Jesus on the cross, he's hanging on the cross and they take the spear and they pierce his head with it. They take the spear and they pierce his head with it. Praise the Lord. You'll have nothing to say about it. This is typically how we sit in church and listen. Oh, maybe it was the head after all. Maybe all these years, I just read it wrong. You know, it was the head after all. It is H-E-A-R-T or H-E-A-D and it is no different. So they took the spear and they pierced his head. Or they pierced his heart. They pierced his side. Basically, it is the heart. From there into the heart. And from there, what comes out? 
the very last drop, the water and the and the blood. Praise the Lord. That very last drop, and therefore, at that moment, his life is now over. Blood has been shed. Blood has come forth. And that blood has washed us as an atonement, and therefore, we have life. We have life. The blood that is life has now been taken from him, has been shed by him, so that we will now be given life. Hallelujah. 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 How significant the blood of Jesus becomes for us. For we now have life because of the power of his holy blood. Hallelujah. 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 That is what we are sustaining ourselves on. That is why we say that we have life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In 1988, there was, um, there was an earthquake in Armenia. And 55,000 people died in that earthquake. Praise the Lord. You know earthquakes? Sri Lanka has earthquakes? No. Just warn me early and tell me so. In case. Some of us pretty much now require some earthquakes to take place to wake up from our slumber. Hallelujah. 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 So in 1955, in 1988, they had an earthquake in Armenia and 55,000 people died. Um, they were doing the rescue operations. After eight days, they found a mother and her three-year-old child under the rubble alive. After eight days. And they couldn't imagine how that child could be alive after eight days, a three-year-old child. What they found out was the mother, seeing that the child is obviously becoming weak, and they are stuck underneath that. Every day she would cut one of her fingers and she would make the child suck the blood. And the child was surviving on that blood. For those eight days, the child was surviving on that blood. Jesus shed his blood and you and I are surviving on that blood. You and I are surviving on that blood and that is why when we come to the altar of the Lord, as Jesus said, when you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, you will have life. You will have eternal life. And therefore, every time we are celebrating the Eucharist, we are surviving on the blood of Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise Hallelujah. 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 So during the Eucharist in your church here in Sri Lanka, during the Eucharist, you, you get the sacred body of Jesus. Do you get the sacred blood? Hallelujah. So in overseas, when, when I was in, in Australia, we would have two chalices as well. And so on both sides, the chalices were there. And everyone was very happy, very delicately taking and drinking the sacred blood of Jesus till COVID struck and suddenly everyone then doesn't want Jesus. Uh, then we, they'll just pass. So we kept it optional. You can have, they will come pass it and go by. So till that time, it was... Uh, uh, something very sacred. So here you get the sacred body of Jesus. Do you get the sacred blood? Hallelujah. Not sometimes. In the flesh, the flesh has life because of the blood. And therefore, when you take the sacred body of Jesus, do you believe that it is the real presence of Jesus? Do you believe it's the real presence of Jesus? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
then there is blood in it because that is life hallelujah hallelujah that blood is what is giving me life every day that blood is what is sustaining me that blood is what is anointing me hallelujah thank you jesus praise you jesus i don't know if you've heard about the miracle or uh, the eucharistic miracle that took place in um buenos aires in argentina i don't know if you heard of that in 1996 a miracle that took place in the archdiocese of present pope francis when he was the archbishop of uh, buenos aires and there he uh, there was a eucharistic miracle that took place in 1996 i came to know about this eucharistic miracle for the first time is when i was in sydney and uh, a person who had offered a property for us to uh, to build a retreat center uh, he called me to his house his name is ron Tess- tesserio if i'm not mistaken with the uh, pronunciation but uh, he's a lawyer and uh, he was he was trying to find out details about different miracles in the catholic church a person who at one point was an atheist and didn't believe in god and he got an opportunity when this eucharistic miracle took place in in argentina the miracle took place is when a sacred host was found abandoned on a little candle stand in the in the church and i think it was the feast i think it was august 6, august 15th the feast of the blessed mother uh, in 1996 and one of the parishioners came and told the priest father there is a sacred host that has been abandoned in the little candle stand so when father went there it was a candle stand underneath a crucifix of jesus and when father saw it over there it was too dusty usually we priests when we see any um sacred host abandoned or if it falls down we usually take and consume it but uh, father didn't do it because it was completely dusty so father took it and put it into a little jar of water as is the normal way to do it what you do would put the a sacred host into the jar of water and leave it there for it to dissolve over a period of time maybe it takes maybe 4 or 5 days and it dissolves and then you dig under the ground and then you put the uh, sacred host uh, there that has um, that has fallen on the ground so that's the normal procedure of what we what we do with uh, a host that is found and that cannot be consumed so father put it into a water a jar of water and he left it there uh, inside the tabernacle they they left it there for some time and after a few days i think it was 10 days later august 26th this happened on august 15th august 26th when they took that jar of water to see if it is if it's dissolved they opened it and they found that that sacred piece of host had turned into blood and there was um there was flesh like pieces i don't know if uh, they can show you that is what it was that is how it was found now it's not just about what happened at the eucharistic miracle there so now pope francis he was at that time the archbishop he wanted experiments done on it for 3 years they actually left it that way for 3 years there was nothing it was there was no open um open devotion towards the eucharistic miracle for 3 years it was kept that way and then pope francis at that time archbishop he um he said that there should be tests done and ron tesserio the person who i met and who actually uh, brought out a beautiful documentary it's there on youtube you can actually search youtube at the, as the eucharistic miracle of buenos aires and and you'll get the the whole documentary but i've seen the extended larger unedited version because he took me to his studio and he's showing me this whole thing and he said they they took the a piece of a small portion of uh that particular uh substance i'm calling it a substance they took a small portion of that particular substance they did pathological tests over this they sent it to a pathologist 
in, in New York called Dr. Frederick, uh, Dr. Frederick Zugibe. And um, he did tests on that particular or on that particular substance without being told where this substance has come from. So he was just given the substance and he's doing tests on that substance without being told where it has come from. And this is his findings. And if you look at the video, I wanted to show you the video, but our internet went down in between. So uh, I can't show you the video. But um, during the video, it is uh, this pathologist, Dr. Frederick, speaks about the Eucharist. And uh, he speaks about the substance. And he says, this substance is, this part of the flesh is a part of the heart tissue. It is a part of the heart tissue. And he said the tissue is degenerating, it happens, this degeneration of that tissue happens only when a person has either got a heart attack or the person's chest or the heart area has been afflicted very badly with extreme pressure of violence that could have been, um, that the person could have gone through. And that is when this heart has this kind of damage in it. And the heart is a portion, that portion is a part of the left ventricle. The left ventricle basically is the portion of the heart that pumps blood to every part of the body. The right ventricle pumps blood, pumps oxygen basically, the blood that has the oxygen towards the body, but it is the the left ventricle that passes on pumps blood into every part of the body. This particular substance was a live tissue and it had white blood cells in it. And so he asked, the, he, he, he asked them how it was stored. And that is when these people told Dr. Frederick where this portion of this substance has come from. And you should look at the video because they've recorded everything as they are interviewing him and his reactions. And his reaction when he hears that this was actually a sacred host that had turned into flesh in a tabernacle, he looks at it and he's astounded. He says, that's impossible. He said, the white blood cells cannot be alive. The moment you take a piece of flesh and put it into water, the white blood cells should die. Unless it is put into certain specific chemicals, the white blood cells will not survive. And he says, these white blood cells is what is there. He said, it is impossible. But that is a heart, it is the tissue of the heart. In that sacred host is the blood of Christ. I'm not explaining the whole thing to you. Actually, uh, Ron has written a full book called, um, I think it's Reason to Believe. I think it's Unseen or Reason to Believe. There are two books he's written, but it's one of the two. But um, uh, there's, there's an extended version of, of all that has taken place. You can check on YouTube or you can check it out on the, on the internet, on Google as well. You'll get, I'm not speaking a lot about that. But just to tell you, in the flesh is the blood. And the blood is what gives life. And therefore, when you and I imagine, you imagine when we are celebrating the Eucharist, that you are eating that. Imagine if you're eating that. That blood is flowing through us. We have life. No wonder Jesus says, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have eternal life. Praise the Lord. So Jesus does not say, this is a symbol of my body. Or this is a symbol. It is not symbolic. The bread and wine, the sacred body and the sacred blood of Jesus is not symbolic. 
And that is the reason why not everyone can just hold a piece of wafer host or a little wine and say a few prayers and do abracadabra and suddenly it changes into a body and blood. It does not happen that way because there is a spiritual process through which the simple piece of host and the little wine turns and becomes the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 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 So when I come and I receive, remember dear brothers and sisters, if you were to think to yourself, if this was given to you, here a miracle takes place and there is blood inside that, that little jar, that same little glass jar I'm holding here in front of you, will you come and drink? Will you come and drink? Just take a look at that. Will you come and drink? Praise the Lord. We are not even confident of that. But every time you partake of the body and blood of Christ in the sacred host, you are doing the very same. Now you understand why it does not actually become flesh or become blood because the Lord knows that we won't be able to handle it. And so there's a transubstantiation, the substance changes, but... It is the body and blood of Jesus. The exteriors might be acceptable to us. Amazing it is. If I held it here, would you come and touch it? See how easily you gave that answer. Actually, for me, this is, the, this is an eye-opener. I didn't ask this question yesterday during the talk. This is the first time I'm asking this question. And I'm actually, in a way, uh, in a way shocked that if, if this body and blood of Jesus was here, that we would think to ourselves, I won't eat. Praise the Lord. But we will touch. But what are we doing in the Holy Eucharist? Just the form is different. This is that same host. No difference. But imagine this is what is happening to us within. The blood of Jesus is flowing through us. And that is why we have eternal life. When that mother gave that blood to that little child. When she gave her blood to that little child. Dear brothers and sisters, here the Lord is telling us, I give my blood to you. My blood flows into your blood. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 That is when we are made whole. Let's turn. Let's, let's, uh, take, let's take Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55 verse... Sorry, Isaiah 53 verse 4 and 5. Isaiah 53 verse 4 and 5 says, surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck by God and afflicted. Continue. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we have been healed. Hallelujah. By his bruises, by his wounds, by his blood, we have been healed. We are healed emotionally. Eternal life is we are healed spiritually and then we are healed emotionally. All our emotions, and we have messed up emotions within us. 
in the midst of our relationships, in the midst of our brokenness, we have a lot of messed up emotions within us. Are you struggling with messed up emotions? Are you struggling with depression? Are you struggling with a lot of emotional instability? Pray that the powerful presence of the blood of Jesus by his wounds and his bruises, I am healed. I remember a young man who came to came to us for a retreat and that was when we were having the one day retreat. I was in Mumbai and we, every month we have a one day retreat. Actually, every week we have a one day retreat, but once a month we have the first Friday uh, retreats as well. So he came on one of the first Friday retreats and he came to me, he spoke to me and he said, Father, I'm going through a lot of depression. I'm not able to bear it because my girlfriend abandoned me. I'm very hurt by it. I've always realized after, after these 18 years of priesthood and, and, and counseling and speaking um, to people, I've realized that generally it's the males who are far more weaker than the females. Females come out of broken relationships in a much better state than males come out of broken relationships. They are a total mess. Uh, women are far more stronger. Males are terrible once they have a broken uh, relationship. And this, this chap, he was, he was so distraught and disturbed. And he came and told me, uh, what hurt me is we were going steady for so many years. And then suddenly one fine day she comes to me and says, my parents are forcing me to get married to, this per to another person, a person who is, um, who is from overseas, from the U.S. And, she's, and she said, uh, my father is, my parents are forcing me for this. So he offered and he said, I'll come to your house and I'll speak to your parents and I'll convince them. And she said, no, don't do it. If you come home, my parents will get violent. And after that, it'll be very tough at home. So please do not come. He kept saying, no, I will come and I will speak to them and convince them. And she said, don't come home. She, they, will, they will get violent and then I can't stay at home. She got married Later on, he came to find out that she wanted to get married to the other person because he comes from the U.S. And, she, and he was wild and angry, and that has led him to depression, in total depression, struggling. And I told him, you pray with the precious blood of Jesus. Ask Jesus to wash your emotions in the precious blood. He went, he came back um, uh, the next month, uh, when we had the first Friday, he came back for the retreat, came and met me, asked him, how is it? Has your depression gone? He said, no, Father, I still have it. But he said, Father, the revengeful feelings that I was having within myself, that has gone away. I don't feel revengeful anymore, but I'm still very depressed. I said, you continue praying with the power of the precious blood. He came back for a Thanksgiving retreat, a residential retreat. Usually when they come for the residential retreat, it's because of certain intentions they have. Came to me and he said, Father, I've come on leave as a Thanksgiving retreat. All that depression that I was going through, every day I would pray asking the precious blood of Jesus to wash my depression. I have been released from it. I feel totally free of that depression. No more depression. I've come now only to give a thanksgiving to the Lord during this retreat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Dear brothers and sisters, we are emotional people. We go through a lot of emotional stress, a lot of emotional pain. Do you think the Lord would be blind to our emotional brokenness? The power of the precious blood of Jesus, when you even receive Holy Communion, tell the Lord, Lord, in the power of your precious blood, you wash. When you are when you're adoring the Lord in the blessed sacrament and you look at Jesus in the blessed sacrament, tell the Lord, you are here in flesh and blood. Wash me, O Lord, in your precious blood and cleanse. Cleanse away all that depression. Cleanse away all that negative emotions. The power of the blood of Jesus will bring healing. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 1 verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. TVs are off. Okay. 
He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sin we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Hallelujah. 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 By his wounds you have been healed. By his stripes you have been healed. Praise the Lord. There is power in that blood of Jesus to bring healing upon us. Spiritual healing, emotional healing, physical healing. Even our physical bodies when it is washed in the precious blood of Jesus. Does the blood of Jesus touch our physical bodies? Does, our, does the blood of Jesus touch our physical bodies? When? When we are receiving Holy Communion. The blood of Jesus is touching our physical bodies. One of our priests, um, one of our brothers, many years ago, I think this was, I think more than 18, no, maybe 22 years ago, uh, because I was in the seminary at that time, and uh, one of our brothers, he was, he's four years uh, senior to me, um, they were on a picnic, he was doing his first year theology, and they were, on, they were going for a picnic, the whole seminary, all the brothers together in a bus, and as they were traveling, uh, he had his hand outside um, the window and his hand was held outside like this. And there was a transport bus, that's a state government bus that was coming the opposite direction that rammed into their bus. And his hand was outside. The bus hit his hand and his hand was cut from here. It was, it was just hanging on skin, nothing else just the skin and nothing else. And, um, and they rushed him to the hospital. When he was in the hospital, the doctor said that they don't have much chance of saving the hand because of the damage that has taken place. And they said they will have to amputate the hand. So this brother cried to the doctor and said, please do not amputate my hand because if his hand is amputated, he'll have to be sent home. A priest cannot be without his, his, or a brother cannot become a priest when you have only one hand because you need to use both your hands even for the Eucharist. And so uh, father kept, this brother kept uh, begging the doctor, please do not amputate my hand. The doctor said, if there is no blood flowing through, we can't do anything about it. And he pricked the finger to see if there's blood, there's no blood coming out. And the brother's brother told uh, the doctor, please give it some time, at least another chance. And uh, the doctor went, he said, I'll come back in 15 minutes and see if there is any blood that is flowing through. Came back in 15 minutes and he pricked the finger, no blood. And he told the brother, I'm sorry, we will have to amputate. He said, please give it just one more chance. 15 minutes later, and the doctor went, the doctor came back 15 minutes later, pricked the finger, no blood. And brother said, please, one more chance. And the doctor pricked the next finger. As brother was lying over there, one prayer that he had, I met this brother in the um, first, first time I saw him was when he was in our provincial house. But when I was doing my regency, I met this brother um, who, had, who was doing his diagnet ministry, and he was narrating the incident to me, and he told me all throughout when I was sitting, lying down on that, lying down on that stretcher over there, all my prayer was, Jesus, let your blood flow through me. Lord Jesus, let your blood flow through me. Lord Jesus, let your blood flow into my hands. I need my hands to become a priest. Doctor came, pricked the first finger, nothing. He said, doctor, just once more. The doctor pricked the next finger. Blood came out. Praise the Lord. After that, he had extensive surgery for his hands. The time when I saw him in the provincial house, his hands were stitched into his stomach. The skin was grafted over so that there will be skin that will start growing. For nearly three, four months, 
he was like this. Just the hand stitched into the stomach. Today, he, he does beautiful ministry. He's a priest. He does beautiful ministry. And uh, he's got a hand that, that you know something has happened to the hand. You just have to take a look at it. And you know something has happened to the hand. But uh, we played cricket with that hand. The blood of Jesus can heal our weakened bodies. If we just let the power of the blood of Jesus start flowing through. When we let the power of the blood of Jesus start replacing the blood that we have within us. One thing know know in your heart, when we pray for the blood of Jesus to flood us, To make space for the blood of Jesus, whose blood needs to go? Whose blood needs to go? Our own selfish, our blood filled with selfishness, greed, and our own own, uh, self-righteousness, and all that negativity that is within our blood has to be displaced for the blood of Christ now to flow freely within us. So when we pray for the blood of Jesus to flow, it is not just about saying, oh, blood of Jesus, touch my hands, touch my legs and heal me. No, it comes at a price. It comes at a price where we tell the blood of Jesus that flows through me, purify the blood that runs within me. The blood of negativity. The blood of deception, the blood of lies, the blood of selfishness, the blood of envy, the blood of impurity, the blood of unholiness. Let that blood be displaced. Let the I be displaced. That is why St. Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, he says, It is no longer I who live. Christ who lives in me. No longer I. Because he has now displaced me. The I person. Hallelujah. 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 If I have bitterness towards my brother or my sister. I don't like my brother sitting over there. Rodney, right? I don't like Rodney. I hate Rodney. I'm sick of him. The things he's done to me, I, you'll never imagine what he's done to me. Oh, by the way, it's just an example. <laughs> Sometimes it's scary to tell you people things. Especially those who have just woken up late. They'll hear only the last part of it and... <laughs> I was once doing an inner healing retreat at uh, inner healing adoration in our retreat center in Porta. And when I'm doing the inner healing adoration, I use first person. I'm helping the, the retreatants to go through the inner healing process. So I'm using first person. So I use I, me, hoping that the retreatants will think of the I and the me. But after the whole adoration got over, as we were going back, one of the volunteers came and told me, Father, we overheard someone say, so sad, Father's life is such a sad life. <laughs> you never know what you people start thinking about. Oh, Rodney is a wonderful man. <laughs> But say, I, I, I can't stick Rodney for a reason. And I, I don't like the man. I, I hate the man. But I come and I pray. And I'm praying with a lot of intensity. Rodney is the only person I don't like. Oh, I like you. I like you. I like you. I like everyone here. But I don't like Rodney. Rodney is the only one I don't like. So uh, am I okay sitting and praying to the Lord? I'm good enough. I feel I'm fine. Right? Am I okay? All of you sitting over here, you all come pure and holy. You have no unforgiveness at all because you think that uh, it's wrong to do it, right? And then why are you sitting here? I'm hoping that you all saints will canonize you. So uh, praise God. I'm blessed to be in your presence. Praise God. So uh, only Rodney is the problem. No one else is the problem. Only Rodney is the problem. So I'm sitting here. I'm feeling good enough. I'm fine. Oh, Jesus, let your precious blood flow into me. Heal, touch, 
Touch me in my emotions. Let your precious blood flow into my body. Touch me, Lord Jesus. Flood me with your precious blood. But Rodney, ah, that, that's a different case. Rodney is a different case. I can't stick the man. But you flow through me. And as he's flowing through me, he's trying to push my negativity towards Rodney away from this body of mine, from these emotions of mine. And he's trying to bring in himself. And yet, though I'm praying, oh Lord, let your precious blood flood my body. Yet I'm stubbornly saying a little bit of myself, I'm still going to keep. When you're flowing, your blood is flowing through. When you reach that stage with this particular incident, just take a little detour. When his blood, when we pray that his blood fills us, it is a substitution that is taking place. The me is dying out and Christ now lives in me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 That is what the Eucharist is supposed to be all about. I receive Jesus. I receive Jesus. I receive Jesus. I receive Jesus. And then I become Jesus. I receive him so much with so much of freedom that in the end, I become another Christ. That is what is happening with the blood of Jesus. What do you thought when you came forward to receive Holy Communion? That it tastes good? That it felt nice? I, remove, I, remove, I receive communion perfectly. Some of us so nicely, we'll kneel down, we'll hold our hands all perfectly well, but deep within the eye is, is thriving. Let the eye die. And let the blood of Jesus flow. And a new creation is formed. Praise the Lord. Praise Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That should be our story. Wherever we go, that should be our story. That we go becoming a new person in Christ. Because the blood of Jesus has now taken total control over me. Hallelujah. 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 Let us all stand. Let's close our eyes. Hold your hands close to your heart. We're going to celebrate the Holy Eucharist in a while. Lord Jesus, your precious blood will flow into me. When I receive you in Holy Communion, it is your blood that will flow into me. I pray, O oh Jesus, I know I get eternal life when I receive you. I know your blood will wash me and wash my emotions. And I know your blood will wash my weak body. Drench it in your precious blood, O oh Jesus. And substitute the impure blood of my emotions with your holy blood of purity. So that I too can say with St. Paul, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.